here and there and there he was playing. the button didn't I? <laughs> I hit the button. Uh, would somebody like to open us up in prayer this morning? Sure. Thanks again. <clears throat> Lord we just uh, thank you for this day. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We pray now Lord as we, uh, we continue in our study of Genesis Lord, that you would uh, just show us the truth you want us to glean from today's class. And we ask that uh, in Jesus name we thank you for Jeff Lord and pray that you would just uh, guide him Amen. All right, here we are, session 23, and uh, we are going to get into the Sabbath. If we can move, there we go. I could take some rabbit trails. Too. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> yeah, that could, I couldn't it? Was yeah. last week. I know. <laughs> Gotta be real careful. Don't open a can of worms. No. I like, I like getting into controversial things and just seeing where we're at. I don't have a problem with getting into discussions like that because I've learned not to get overheated. I used to get really overheated by some of that kind of stuff, and it just I would just get so mad. But uh, the Lord has helped me to calm down when I need to calm down, which gives me the opportunity to talk to people that don't believe as I believe but still stay calm. I just talk bad about them behind their back. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> So anyway, but yeah, this week we're back on track. Uh, we're going to get into, this is the seventh day, and we're going to talk about the Sabbath. And I put a question up here, what is it all about, and how do we honor it? And what I'm going to do, uh, I've grabbed, of course, several slides from uh, Chuck Missler's uh, Bible study, and I've also thrown in a lot of mine and kind of altered some things. And this is, this is kind of a huge topic. Uh, so I don't think we're going to be able to tackle it in one time. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, but the way this is kind of set out is we're going to kind of throw out a whole bunch of stuff and then try to draw a conclusion at the end. But I kind of wanted to get your opinion up front to start the, to start the discussion. What do you guys feel about the Sabbath day? What is it for? How do we honor it or do we honor it anymore? Was it just for Israel? What do you guys think? <laughs> All right, I'm going to start here, guys. Here he goes. Here we go. You ready? Okay. The last people are all kind of Take one. Talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of afraid who's the seventh day yeah. Adventist. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do too. They scream, jump up and down, and uh, you know, go on and on and on about the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, it is mathematically impossible to know what day the Sabbath is. The Sabbath may be Wednesday. We don't know. Because you know, if the seventh day of God's creation was the day he rested, that is our model and that is the Sabbath. So mathematically, you would have to know how many days the earth has existed. Then divide that by seven and go back to the seventh day to determine which day of the week is Sunday. Because it wasn't and a calendar then. There was no calendar. <laughs> and these people freaked out about that. And to me, the principle remains that one day per week is to be set aside for rest, for reflection, in the way that God did. Yeah. But 
what is the Sabbath? I don't know. It may start Tuesday afternoon at 3.30. We have a freaking idea. There's no way to know. Yeah. It is mathematically impossible to know that unless you know the age of the earth. The one thing we do know is it's from sundown to sundown. That's about it. On Sunday. On Sunday. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, you know uh, Jesus did away with the law. And um, so, anyway, there's, there's my opinion. I think the principle remains and is still being honored. Yeah. But the sundown to sundown on certain days, we, we don't know what it is, we try. Yeah. Anybody else? What you think about the Sabbath, or what comes to mind when you think about it? It's one day a week set aside to worship God, and I think that that, and I agree with him. It doesn't matter what day of the week that you rest, as long as you rest one day of the week. And wasn't it Paul that said something about uh, um, uh, some men honor one day, some men honor another day, mm -hmm. and uh, that's left up to us as individuals. Some may think one day more important than another, and, and you know different items like that. So I think that uh, if God had to work seven days and He thought it was time to take a day off, yeah. then we should probably take a day off out of seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, back to your Seventh Day Adventist comment, there is actually uh, they believe that not necessarily the mark of the beast will be, but one of the things in the end times will be the instituting of a Sunday law where everybody has to worship on a Sunday and that's how they believe that they're going to be persecuted because they worship from you know Friday till Saturday uh, that kind of thing so yeah so there's some very and, they, and they're a group that considers themselves Christian I have a book at home written by a Seventh-day Adventist that says what do Seventh-day Adventists believe and uh, it's almost like they're Christian it's almost like the book of Galatians where Paul was talking about the Christians who wanted to take on Jewish customs and when you read that book and then you read what they do, it's like, it's kind of like that letter should have been written, was written to them, saying, guys, you're, you're going about this a little wrong here. So, but we'll get into this here. Uh, we've actually brought this scripture up, but we're back to it again. So, <laughs> the seventh day. Uh, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Uh, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which he created and made. And of course, uh, you can tell just right from there that the seventh day was established from the very beginning. It wasn't something that was established during the time of Moses or during the time of the giving of the law. But we'll get into that. A little background. Uh, question, how many of each animal did Noah take into the ark? How many of each animal did Noah take into the ark? Up to seven. Yeah. Two of some kind, seven of other. Yeah. So what was the seven of? The ones that are sacrificed. Yeah, clean. clean. Two by two is the unclean. Okay, yeah. Two of each of the unclean, but seven of each of the clean. Most people get the two by two, but they forget about the seven. So, how do they know which one were which? Uh, that's part of it. But most of the time you think of when they talk about clean and unclean, it was during the time of the giving of the law. Which was, you know, in Leviticus that talks about clean and unclean animals. But here, before the giving of the law, before Moses, before going up on Sinai, they're talking about clean and unclean animals. That's kind of interesting. In other words, some of these things were established long before they were talked about in uh, among the Jewish nation. Uh, take a look here. Of course, these are ceremonial definitions, but they were ordained in Genesis, but they were codified in Leviticus. Point being here is that, with respect to the Sabbath, they said the Sabbath was established in the beginning, but later on it was codified and established, and laws were built around the Sabbath day. So the Lord established it in the beginning. He sanctified it. He made it holy. Sanctified. You guys know what that means, right? It means to set apart. It was hallowed. It was a blessed day. So it was done in the beginning. So it was done before there was a nation of Israel. So it kind of makes you think, okay, Lord, what is the significance of the Sabbath day? Is there something more to this than that we should be thinking about? 
Were you pointing to something far more important? A lot of things we find are rooted back in Genesis. The clean and the unclean, the kinsman redeemer, substitutionary atonement, the Sabbath. All these established in the book of Genesis, but spoken of later. Well, do you know what the one book is that talks about the kinsman redeemer in a story form? It's actually the book my wife's doing it in our home group. Ruth? Yep. Ruth. Book of Ruth. Talking about a kinsman redeemer. And guess who our kinsman redeemer is? Jesus Christ. And the book of Ruth, uh, in order to be a kinsman redeemer, you had to be of the same tribe. You had to be willing to do it. And you had to be able to do it. And of course, that's why Christ had to come down to the earth to be one of us. And he had to be willing to do it, which he was, because he loved us. And he had to be able to do it. And he could because he was without sin. So there's some interesting things that are actually established in the book of Genesis that carry throughout the rest of the Bible. Of course, we've talked about this in the beginning, that many doctrines are found rooted right in Genesis. And we see a lot of things that are established right there before they're expounded upon, explained further, codified later on. So that's why Genesis is such a, a very important book. Probably one of the reasons why I'm taking forever to get through it. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, many things are spoken of in detail later in Scripture, but are established in the beginning of Genesis. The scriptural view, Exodus 20, 11, says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Of course, here the word for hallowed is the same used in the word as uh, sanctified in Genesis 2, 3. What's the word Sabbath mean? Uh... You know, I didn't look that up. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't think that it's stopping. Well, Chris, that's your assignment. <laughs> that's a good question. I didn't stop the thing. I think it means rest, but I don't have my, I actually don't even have my program on here. There's nothing that we've talked about so far indicates that, that it's a day of worship. Unless the word Sabbath means worship by the Yeah, I'd have to look that up. But yeah, it's seen as a day of rest. It's right, it's a day of rest. Yeah. We're to worship him every day. Yeah. But for convenience, it would appear that we've set aside Sunday to gather together and do a corporate worship. Yeah, I think it was in the new church that said that it was on the first day of the week, which was in essence the Sunday, that they gathered together to worship. Right. So um, the question I put up here is what are some other things in scripture that are holy and sanctified as you think through scripture what are the things that God has called holy and also called sanctified well, for one we are when we are in Christ we are separated from the world we are sanctified we are justified we are glorified and we're also sanctified. Of course, holy. Of course, God Himself is holy. So the Bible says, "Be holy, for I am holy." He calls us into holiness and righteousness. I guess my point I was trying to make here is that this is something very special that God has established, calling it holy and sanctified. So, I wanted to understand. I've been praying a lot about this because I want to understand, Lord, how do you want me to honor this day? Is it just to, to remain idle at home, to rest? Because I can do that. <laughs> That's not a problem. I can declare that to my wife, honey. <laughs> Nothing. No honey-do list, no, no work, because God said so. But is there something deeper to this? And that's what I'm thinking. That's what I was getting into. I think there's a little bit more than just resting. I think resting is part of it, but there's something deeper. Football. <laughs> <laughs> Football. Racing. That's good. Uh, of course, uh, established in Genesis, codified later on in Exodus. Um, and of course, the Sabbath established before the nation of Israel. So it was established there, practiced before giving of the Ten Commandments. If you take a look, whenever they collected manna, manna meant what? It was the bread from heaven. It was collected on, it's, they were told not to collect on the seventh day, uh, which was given in Exodus 16, but the law was actually given in 20. So they were actually practicing resting on the Sabbath day before even the law was given. So it was established back in the beginning, 
practice in it even before they're given of the law. So kind of gives you the thought that it's not just for the Jewish nation. It's for us. But what does it mean? What part of this is for us? Uh, the Institute of the Sabbath. Uh, it, it does become very distinctive of Israel. Actually, somebody had said that the Jewish, the, the, the calendar for the Jew is his catechism. Uh, they, everything they do is based upon a Sabbath, a new moon, uh, a festival, a feast, very much tied into the calendar. Uh, there's many mosaic laws concerning the Sabbath, such as uh, like kindling a fire on the Sabbath was forbidden. And actually the penalty for profaning the Sabbath by doing any work on it was death. That's pretty significant. That's pretty, you know, any work that you do. But, this is funny, is uh, however the priest carried on the duties about the temple. There's a lot of activities going on during the Sabbath day. There was work that was taking place. Even so much as the rite of circumcision had to be performed if it fell on the eighth day on the Sabbath. They couldn't wait the day, they couldn't do it the day before, they couldn't do the day after. If the eighth day for the circumcision fell on the Sabbath, they had to do it. So that was considered a form of a work, but it was forgiven. So you start to see something here. Let's see if I can get this to come up. You start to see that it's actually pointing to something deeper. Even Christ had made the point to the Pharisees and the Sadducees how the priests profaned the Sabbath by doing the work on the Sabbath. But they were told to do that work on the Sabbath. So there's something else going on here than just work, than just abstaining from work. Of course, some of the abuses that had taken place, Isaiah condemned the hypocrisy of the worshipers. Uh, he defined true Sabbath keeping as turning from one's ways and own pleasure and taking delight in the Lord. And as a matter of fact, would somebody like to read Isaiah chapter 58, 13, and 14? If you got your Bibles with you, would somebody mind? Somebody take this one, somebody take Amos 8, 4, and somebody take Jeremiah 17, 27. This is the part where I rest and you take over. Get this over with so I can get moving on and doing my other stuff. 
So their heart is not towards the Lord, it's towards themselves. And so the Sabbath seems to be making reference to abstaining from our pleasures, from our desires, from the things that we want, to go after the things that God wants. And let's also take a look at Jeremiah 17, 27. But if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying by not carrying any load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortresses. Yeah. And again, just pointing out that the Lord is still, He still hallows this day. He's still very upset with, with the Jews when they do not mark this day aside. And the one thing when I was reading this, as I was studying this, this question came up to me. Why should we cease from our pleasures on just one day? Why not cease from them every day and seek the Lord always? And there's something I noticed the way in which the Lord teaches. And I, I like how he does this. Um, let me see if I bring this up. The Lord's way of teaching causes us to ask questions to dig deeper and to search out our own hearts. And I started to think as I was studying this, and I, this, I, I get this a lot of times when I study other things in Scripture. There's a way in which the Lord teaches that seems to cause us to draw near to Him for those that really want to know Him. Like, for example, if you take a look at uh, the road to Emmaus. As they were walking along, those two guys, this was after the resurrection, the two men were discussing all the things that happened in Jerusalem. And then Jesus comes up walking beside them. And they're talking about all this stuff. And, and He says, well, what are you guys talking about? And they said, well, everything that's going on in Israel. He said, well, what things? Obviously, he knew what they were talking about. He knew what happened. He was there. He's, he's the whole purpose for being there. But he was prompting these men to start talking. He said, well, what, what things? Well, then they start to talk about it. And so, in a sense, he was drawing out of them what was really in their heart. And, of course, as they were walking along, it says that they, they came to two ways, and he would have gone would have gone one way. But the men said, no, come follow us and come with us. And I think the Lord has a way of, in one sense, drawing out of us what's inside of us, and in another way, causing us to see if we truly are seeking Him. And when I started studying the Sabbath and the purpose of the Sabbath and the sacrificial system and all those things, I think the Lord has a deeper purpose there for doing all that stuff. One of the things in the Passover Seder, traditionally, they have a young child come up and, and stand at a, a certain time in the, in the Sabbath and he'll say, why every day we do this, but on this day we do this? Why, you know, every other night of the week we eat this way, but this way we eat this? And it seems like within the Jewish community, at least with the scriptures, there is a constant pushing them to ask the question, why the sacrificial system? Why on the Sabbath? Why the following of these laws? Why this? Why this? Why do we do these things, Lord? And I think it's the Lord is trying to draw out of us something deeper, something more. And I see this a lot in the way he teaches. Of course, like for example, the rich young man in Matthew 19, 21, there was the young man who came up, he said, what must I do to obtain salvation? He says, you know, he goes through keeping of the law, you know, to keep this, this, and this. And the young man said, well, I've kept all those things up from my youth. What am I lacking? He said, well, sell everything you got, give it to the poor and come follow me. And it said that the young man walked away disheartened because he had many uh, possessions. Now Christ could have said to him, well, you're lacking the, the, the fact that you're, you're rich and you don't want to give up your possessions and on and on and on. He could have told him directly. But he told him in a manner in which he himself realized what he was lacking. And, I'm, and I knew I was going to have trouble trying to explain this, but it seems like the Lord has a great way of teaching us that forces us to look at ourselves rather than him constantly pointing directly to us. He, he does give us direct commands, but he has a way of teaching us that causes us to think, causes us to dig deeper, and causes us to reflect on who we are as a person. Yes, Brian. Well, as a woodworker, um, he, I, I, this analogy may help a little bit. But, uh, as, as, as a carpenter, Jesus was familiar with, the, with either the wedge or the, or the chisel, and what he does is he gives us um, that part of us which reflects on on those things that we know we should not be be doing that, uh, that we should the conviction and all he does is he places his 
uh, if you've ever split wood or used a chisel, um, you take and place it against in the middle of a, uh, of a of a piece, and there's there's a portion that you want to keep and a portion you want to remove. <coughs> and so the Lord places that chisel or that wedge in place and and gives us a a wooden maul. Uh, the desire to seek Him. And as we, each time we are convicted of those things that uh, we know we should or shouldn't be doing, we take that maul and we strike that chisel, uh, shaving off those portions of us that we should that should be removed and keeping the part that, that should be kept. And I think as a, it, if you can see that analogy, uh, whether it's, you know, splitting a, splitting a log into two pieces, the desirable and the undesirable, um, many times he gave us he gives us the tools to cleave away from our lives those things which are undesirable but he leaves those things that he gives us the tools but he doesn't do it directly he doesn't he doesn't strike the strike the chisel he doesn't strike the uh, the wedge he gives us the tools so that we may go undergo the transformation with his help with yeah. his assistance yeah, and I think one of the tools is our own conscience that bears witness that's to right the, and wrong. That's the maul or the or the or the or the, the striking tool. Yeah. Because each time that that convicts us of something that we should or shouldn't be doing, um, the intent is for us to to follow him and cleave away from ourselves to separate ourselves from the uh, the undesirable. Yeah. And like for example, the woman that was found in adultery, um, of course, his answer to them was. He who was without sin cast the first stone. And, of course, they all had to stop and think, well, which one of us is without sin? He didn't stand there and say, well, you're all sinners, so you're just as bad as her. He put it in a question format so that they could then reflect upon themselves and decide, oh, yeah, I am a sinner. And, yeah, I've done wrong. And, yeah, she's done wrong, too, but it's just as bad. And so the Lord has this great way of teaching us that, like he was talking about, he makes use of, of the things he gave us, our own conscience that bears witness to right and wrong, uh, our understanding of those things that cause us to, to stop and ask our own selves why. And I've noticed that when I discover uh, or come to an understanding rather than somebody telling me, it seems to solidify in myself more so than when somebody tells me about it. Do you guys kind of get the same way? If you learned it yourself, it seems to stick in there better than if somebody told you. And the Lord has a great way of doing that. It, it's, and I've, I wish I could perfect that myself, but I, I haven't yet. Of course, then, of course, the whole thing like render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God which that which is God. So he, he, he made that statement, and you're left to ask, well, what does belong to God? What does belong to Caesar? And, of course, they said it, it was great wisdom, and nobody questioned him after that. Uh, again, with... Uh, the chief priests and elders asking Jesus by what authority he does miracles. Uh, Jesus responds with a question about John's baptism. Was it of God or of men? Because he knew their hearts. He knew that if they were to say it was of God, then he would say, why aren't you listening to me? But he knew that if they say it was of men, then they would have angered the people because they cared more about how they looked in front of the people than they did before God. So he understood what was, rather than directly telling them these things, he allowed those tools within them to be used to draw it out of them. So it stuck harder. And so I oftentimes think that with, uh, with uh, and of course like we talked last week about block logic, how God will use these paradoxes to cause us to search out the answer. And I agree with you, there is an answer. But I also believe that, uh, the, God, that the Lord will present these opposing viewpoints to cause us to, are we going to search deeper? Or are we going to turn around and say, well, that book is full of contradictions. There's no point in listening to it. And like uh, the debate I've been having or had, did have with uh, Brian's sister, who's the atheist, that's one of the things she said. Well, your book is full of contradictions. There's just contradictions everywhere. Well, no, there's no contradictions. But the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And God wrote it in that manner so that when you saw a contradiction, you just wanted to throw the book away. You didn't really want to search it out. So the Lord has this interesting way of pulling us in and causing us to, to ask, why did you do this, Lord? Why did you say it this way? Why, why the Sabbath? Why the sacrificial system? Why the, the feasts and the festivals? Why? And the Jews, that's a common question. Why? Do you have an answer? Well, it's interesting. He kind of uh, 
solidified the um, the ask, ask or answer a question with a question. Yeah, yeah, to cause you to think, to cause you to think. And I, I, could, I was trying to think of a good modern example, and this is cheesy, but this is the best I could do. Remember the Karate Kid? <laughs> When he was told to paint the fence, sand the floor, wax the car, that whole time, the kid thought he was just doing chores for the man. He thought, this is silly, wax the car this way, sand the floor this way, paint the fence this way. He said, I'm just, you know, I'm just your worker. This is stupid. Why am I doing this? And it wasn't until he brought it together and made him understand that the whole time he was being taught. Well, that's kind of the way, in a sense, I look at the things that were given to the Jews, the sacrificial system, the ceremonial law. Um, the, the feasts and the festivals, the new moons, those were all pointing to something. Those were, in a sense, a training or a shaping. <coughs> for on one hand, I think, to cause them to ask, Lord, why? Yes, on this one day, I'm supposed to give you my all. But Lord, aren't I supposed to give you my all every day? Aren't I supposed to rest in you completely? Because you say that I'm, you know, my works, they're, they're no good. My works are my works are my righteousness is as filthy as rags. I think it was the Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, had said that. So, Lord, my works mean nothing. So, I think a lot of these things was was in a sense of building up uh, to to witness not just to the Israelites but to the world. There's something more here, and I think that's what the Lord was pointing to. Uh, like, for example, the exile. Uh, Hosea had predicted that God would make Israel Sabbaths to cease because of her unfaithfulness. And I've got it right here. Hosea 2.11 says, I will cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Uh, Israel had tried to mix the Lord. And this is with reference to the chapter. Lord, uh, Israel had tried to mix the Lord God with other gods. And of course, God will not have be mixed with anything else. And what was going on at this time is Israel was trying to take the ways of Baal, the ways of Asherah, and the ways of God and mix them all together. But God had said, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be mixed with any other gods, and there will come a day where I'll take all these things away. So if the Sabbath was that important, if the sacrificial system was that important, that it had to be done in order to have a right way with God, then why did God take it away? So my point being is that there was something more deep or spiritual that God was trying to teach these people other than just following rules or falling into legalism. Uh, uh, so just like the sacrificial system, observance of the Sabbath has a deeper spiritual meaning, at least in my opinion. Uh, as we take, like I said, I'm going to throw out a whole bunch of stuff and hopefully we'll get to the conclusion here real soon. Uh, Sabbath in the New Testament, Jesus' custom was to attend the synagogue on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus taught the authority and the validity of the Old Testament law. His his emphasis was not on the external observance of the law, but on the spontaneous performance <coughs> of the will of God, which underlay the law. And as you know, a lot of statements that Jesus made, he had shown where he was going <coughs> further than what the law had said. You know, he says, as it been said in old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, even if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. So he went even further than what the law had said. So he was basically showing, look, the law stated this, but I'm going I'm to go a little bit further. I'm going to go into your heart. And I personally think that's where it was always pointing towards. The law, like Paul talked about, was a schoolmaster. It was to teach us and to show us that we're sinners and that we need salvation and we need to be saved from ourselves. And I think that's what all this was doing. It was pointing to something deeper. Um, as we, I'm sorry, I keep talking. You guys have any comments? I'm, I'm just rambling here. Uh, we take a look at the six conflicts that had taken place. Uh, of course, Jesus, as he defended his disciples for plucking grain on the Sabbath day by alluding to the time when David and his men ate the bread of presence. Uh, these are, of course, when Christ was breaking the Sabbath, or at least in their minds he was breaking the Sabbath. He also reminded his critics that the priests in the temple profaned the Sabbath and were held guiltless. That's when we talked about they actually did their main work was on the Sabbath. Uh, he referenced to circumcising a male on the Sabbath day. Uh, he expressed anger over those in Capernaum who showed more concern for the punctilious observance of the Sabbath than for a human being who was deprived of the use of a hand. You ever thought about reading that? How cold their heart must have been that they were more concerned about an observance than they were about somebody being healed. Yes. Something 
definitely applies to that. They kind of put in really good words and brought that. Because uh, I just read that. Uh, I, I've been studying the New Testament. Oh, okay. Lately, and I read something from Joe Sober, and he said, you will never understand bureaucracy until you grasp the concept that for bureaucracy, outcome is nothing and policy is everything. And that is perfectly exemplified yeah. in that passage. Yeah. Outcome is nothing. Yeah. Policy. That's is that's God. yeah. That's the highest thing is the policy. Stick to the stick to the law. Stick to the policy. Yeah. Sometimes it's the same with sticking to tradition. We have to do this because it's tradition. Why do we do this? Well, it's tradition. We have to do this. Why? And I think that's one of the things that the Lord was doing here when He was healing these folks on the Sabbath. It was making them ask why, because all the leadership had told them, "You don't do anything on the Sabbath. We have our rules." You can only walk so far, you can only pick up so much, you can only go this way. That's it. But Jesus came along and just messed all that up. It was forced them to ask, why is he doing this? He's doing only the things that God could do, but why is he breaking the law? Well, maybe there's more to it than just holding to the law. Uh, of course, Jesus rebuked uh, the ruler of the synagogue who became indignant when he healed a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus asserted his lordship over the Sabbath, of course. Uh, seven healings were done on the Sabbath. Not all, of course, were done on the Sabbath. There were some that were done in another day. But on each one of these, the Lord angered the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But again, he was forcing them to ask the question, why? Why? why what's the purpose of the Sabbath? Because that's the whole thing. They, they messed up the law so bad that the Lord was, in a sense, untwisting it. And of course, any time you have to straighten out something, it's going to be painful. I know that from experience. I think you guys do too. Uh, let's see. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. I wrote a note here. Uh, even though there is a greater spiritual aspect to the Sabbath, I believe there is a practical wisdom that when it comes to, fit, to the physical, too much work will cause one to burn out. We need frequent and often rest from the work. I know I keep pointing towards the spiritual aspect of the Sabbath, but I think there's a physical aspect too. The Lord understands we need rest. And I know my dad, uh, he was a workaholic. He worked, you know, seven days a week. He would just, and then he burned himself out. And uh, I think the Lord, he made us, he knows us, and he understands we need that time of rest. So I don't think he, I used to feel guilty for taking a day, a, a down day or taking some time off or sleeping in on a Saturday. Uh, but now I, as the more I understand the Word of God and realize that oftentimes God will teach a physical truth to relate to a spiritual truth. Uh, but that spirit, that physical truth is still true. So I just wanted to bring that up. I know I'm keep pointing towards the spiritual aspect, but I think there's a physical aspect. We need to take some time off. And I have no problem with that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were no commercials on Sunday? It's yes. <laughs> Well, I guess if you turn the TV off, there isn't any. <laughs> uh, but uh, moving on here, uh, the early church Christians were loyal, were loyal Jews. They worshipped daily in the temple. They attended services. Of course, there was the dispute over the requirements of Gentile Christians. It was resolved at the Jerusalem Council, which is Acts 15. And the only thing that they put upon the Gentiles, because there was this dispute, okay, you, you know, we're Jews, now the Gentiles are coming in, you know, we practice all these laws. Shouldn't the, the Gentiles have to do the same thing? And so there was a dispute arose. Paul went up. They had the discussion. And, uh, and then it was Peter who finally stood up and talked about what took place at the house of Cornelius, that the, the Holy Spirit came upon them just as he came upon us. And they said, well, okay, we're going to write a letter. The only thing we're going to require uh, is that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. So, what? I don't understand that part. The Which first two I can understand. Yeah. Why the sprinkling blood? What's that got to do with anything? Well, they weren't supposed to take blood because the scriptures say the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, of course, fornication. Things strangled. There was something in the Old I can't remember what that was. There was something in the Old Testament talked about that from not having eaten an animal that was strangled. Do you guys remember? I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. It, this also, this if I remember, this may also be in reference to uh, a sacrifice that is done to an idol, in the in the manner in which it was sacrificed. The indication that these were animal sacrificed to idols. So, 
So it's don't worship idols and don't eat anything that's been sacrificed to an idol. I think that's what it was. I'd have to look that back up. But the point here being is they weren't putting any of these, these Jewish laws upon them. You know, observance of the Sabbath, observance of the feast days, the festivals, the new moons, the sacrificial system, none of that. This is all they had said. <coughs> Of course, Paul on the Sabbath, the law, he said, was a yoke of bondage from which the, the Christian had been set free. Uh, of course, that's, like we said, over in Galatians. The whole book of Galatians is a good book to read to, for this kind of discussion for those Christians who want to start taking upon uh, Levitical law. And Paul makes it very good, clear that, you know, no, that's, that's, those all were a shadow of things to come. They're all pointing to something. Uh, he made no distinction between moral law and ceremonial law. It was all part of the Old Covenant, which was done away in Christ. It was nailed to the cross. Uh, let's see, the Sabbath and festivals are declared to be only a shadow of what is to come. And I think that's one of the key verses to in this whole dispute is, is this one right here. These were shadows. These were, again, these were things that were pointing to something else. And, of course, what were they shadows of? The Sabbath, the feasts, the new moons, the sacrificial system. They're all pointing to Christ. Yeah. They're all shadows or types or symbols of Christ. And now that Christ has come, who is greater than all those things, then there's no necessary to continue them. Again, these were, in a sense, what Paul called his schoolmasters, teaching us what was to come. And of course, again, I think it was always prompting them, why do we always kill the lamb? Why does it have to be spotless? Why the scapegoat? Why is it, why the sins placed upon that scapegoat and sent outside the camp? And of course, as soon as Christ, the, he's, the sins were placed upon him, he was, he was hung outside the city. All those things, they kept pointing to, to Christ. Kind of like, you know, when the karate kid realized I was being taught the whole time, I just didn't understand fully what I was being taught until it all came together. Well, when Christ had come, it all came together. That's what it was pointing towards, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, and again, also to observe days and months and seasons and years is to, the, to be slaves to the weak and beggarly element. Again, that's in Galatians. And the observance of days is a characteristic of the man who is weak in faith. And Dan, like you had said, you know, uh, Paul had said, you know, some observe a day, some observe every day. But whatever you do, regard it unto the Lord. So we don't have to worship him on one day. We can worship him every day. But whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Not in some legalist, legalistic fashion. There are some prophetic implications as to what will come in the millennium. Sabbaths will actually continue as a basis for worship in the millennium. And in Ezekiel's temple, the gate to the inner court is closed six days, open only on the Sabbath and the day of the new moon. Of course, in Isaiah 66, 22, 23, it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and, and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And then again, also in Ezekiel 46, 1, Thus saith the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. So there is indication that we will actually know the Sabbath day and we will worship on the Sabbath day. But again, I, I believe that what all of that was culminating to was to point towards the fact of it's in Christ. And it's to abstain from our pleasures, from our desires, to stop our work. In one sense, it's to stop our work of trying to gain access into heaven. Another thing is to stop our work of trying to please ourselves. That's my interpretation. So where are we? There are no grounds for imposing the Sabbath on the Christian who is free from the burden of the, law, of the law's demands. The Spirit of Christ enables him to fulfill God's will apart from eternal observance of the law. And of course, where it kind of comes together is the writer of Hebrew alludes to the Sabbath as a type of God's rest, which is an inheritance of the people of God. And it actually encourages to labor to enter into that rest. And that rest is found in Christ. So I think the Sabbath was symbolic of the rest that we find in Christ. I think I uh, yeah, taught a spiritual truth through physical observance. It was a shadow of the rest that was to come through Christ. 
And I believe that we honor the Sabbath by remaining faithful to, to Jesus Christ, who is Lord over the Sabbath. So I believe that when we are in Christ, we are honoring the Sabbath, in my opinion. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. We're almost to the end of the seventh day. <laughs> Let's keep going. <gasps> that was the end. We're on to the next verse. What time is it? Oh, okay, we got 15 minutes. Wow. Wait a minute. That, there was no boom. There was no... Because <laughs> that's the end of the creation week. We're, on, we're moving on. <laughs> i got to take a drink for that one. Hold on a second. Wow. How long has that been? That's beginning of January. Right? Yeah. When's the longest day of the year? Is that tomorrow? 21st. 21st? 21st. Wow. Went from the sh almost the shortest day of the year to the longest day of the year. That's pretty good. We'll move it on here real quick. Uh, Genesis 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the heaven and the earth. Or the, the earth and the heavens. Generations. Uh, the Hebrew word is Tolidoth. It is the word from which the book of Genesis gets its name. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, renders the word as Genesis. So it's referring to generations. And oftentimes you'll see this phrase, these are the generations of, which are actually marking key subdivisions of the book. And there's actually ten subdivisions. Let's see if I can hit these buttons quick enough here. Of course, the first one that we'll see is Genesis 2, 4 talking about the generation of the heavens and the earth. Then we'll, of course, see the generations of Adam, uh, the generations of Noah, and then the generations of the sons of, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And this is, uh, sometimes if you look in your Bible at the top of Genesis 10, it'll say Table of Nations. And uh, there's a really good book out there. I've read part of it. It's called After the Flood. And you can actually read it online for free right there. You don't have to write this down. These, of course, I put, Dan, I put my notes up on our church website, so okay. if you want to get that book. And it, and it discusses how the nation spread out based upon what it says here in Genesis 10, kind of showing where the different family groups had gone to. Uh, but, of course, uh, the book, uh, Genesis, begins to narrow its focus on that of Shem and Abraham and, of course, eventually onto the line which will come to uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and then, of course... Era, Abram's father, Ishmael, mentions Ishmael, then Isaac, then Esau, and then Jacob. And if you count them, there's ten. There's kind of ten subdivisions uh, in the book of Genesis, and of course that's why it gets its name, referring to generations. Uh, there is some uh, view, the traditional view states that each of the ten sections were written by a patriarch <coughs> for that generation and then handed down to the next generation until it was received by Moses, who then compiled the works together. Uh, but as stated in the beginning of this course, Jesus actually attributed the first book to Moses. So, whether you, whether the Lord dictated the book of Moses, or dictated the book to Moses, or whether he inspired him to pull passages from a compilation, it's not really clear as to which one it was, but of course it is clear that the, the book of Genesis is inspired by the Lord. This is kind of a traditional view uh, that different generations compiled it, put it together, and then handed it off to Moses. Either way, I think the book is, is fully inspired. We've talked about that in the beginning. So, um, uh, of course, each listing of the generations comes at the end of the narrative. So, uh, Genesis 2, 4, it's actually kind of like a bookend of the creation week. You'll oftentimes get the narrative of Noah and his family, then you'll have the generation. You'll get the narrative of Abram, then you'll get his, his uh, genealogy at the end of that. So this is Genesis 2, 4 is kind of that bookend. In the, in the first part was, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Then at the end it says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. So kind of this bookend there. Man, we're moving fast. <laughs> is it making you nervous? Yeah. I feel like we should slow down. We should have more discussion. You guys tired this morning? No, I'm not. Huh? Yeah, we're not. Not as many people. 
And every, every plant of the field before it was on the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was a man, there was not, not a man to till the ground, but there went up a midst from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Uh, before it grew and there was no rain. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris comments on this, this statement, before it grew, teaches the fact of a mature creation or creation of apparent age. The first plants did not grow from seeds, but were created full grown. And that's where I stand, is that you know God didn't plant seeds and then wait for it to grow. They were mature uh, before uh, when he created all things. So that whole question of, you know, was it the chicken or the egg? Yeah, the, chicken came first. the chicken came first. <laughs> of course, for the evolutionist, it's the ooze that came first. And then the single cell, the me button, on and on and on. But uh, it says there was no rain. Uh, like we talked before, creationists believe that the hydrologic cycle of the pre-flood world was subterranean rather than atmospheric due to a possible water canopy increase atmospheric pressure and a global uniform temperature. And we talked a lot about that and you know when we're going through the creation, what that world was possibly like. And I can't remember if I sent you guys an email about it, but I was reading an article about one of the deepest wells that has ever been drilled is in Russia. Uh, it went like it's either seven miles or fourteen miles down. I can't remember which one it was. But the one surprising thing they had found is that there was a massive amount of water that far down. They expected to uh, find basalt at, at, a, at a temperature of like 300 degrees Fahrenheit, but they actually found <coughs> water or in the form of steam or almost like a plasma uh, was at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They actually even found microorganisms way down there. Very surprised at it. Uh, it was a much higher heat, much higher water content, and much higher in uh, organic life all the way down there. So when the Bible says that the fountains of the deep were broken up, I still think there's still some fountains of the deep still up underneath there. We talked about, I think China, it was, China? yeah, China. China. China has one of the largest underground <clears throat> oceans underneath it. And a lot of that is not just a big empty, big cavern with all water. It's, it's porous rock that has a lot of water in, in it, kind of like uh, oil. Oil is not just big pools. It's usually found within the cracks and the crevices and the pores of the rock. They call it flinty rock. So, but Yeah, and, and according to this, there was no rain, uh, and a lot of it may have been to, to uh, increase atmospheric pressure, which didn't allow a lot of uh, water evaporation. So if that's true, when Noah started preaching that there was going to be rain coming down from the heavens, they probably thought he was crazy, because they didn't see it before. What are you talking about? The water's in the, the streams, and there's dew on the ground in the morning, but, you know, the rain? No. So. Good old Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah. Yeah, right. You build me an ark. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, what's an ark? Yeah, what's, what, an what's a cubit? Yeah, that's a cubit. <laughs> so, uh... So this is not another account of the creation week, but a, a repetition of that original account, like we talked about before Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is uh, a rhythm of ideas, a repetition, it's not a rhythm of words. And you'll see this, of course, critics will say that chapter 2 is, an, is another creation account. Well, it's not another creation account. It's the retelling in different detail of the, that original account. So it's not a new account, it's just the retelling of it. And we see that often throughout scripture. Man, we're going fast. We gotta slow down. <laughs> I gotta put the brakes on. I got five minutes here. I think we can get through this because I can get to the end here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and of course, Genesis 1:26 through 27 states that man was made in God's image. And here it says how he was physically made. He was made from the dust of the ground, or dust of the earth. And scientifically, that's been proven, that what's inside of us, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you pretty much can find uh, all in the ground. So when we decompose, we just go back to dirt dust. 
Uh, but of course, we have a distinction. It's called a living soul, and the Hebrew word is china fesh, which actually distinguishes us from every other living creature. Like a, a tree has a body, animals have a body and a soul, but man has a body, soul, and a spirit, and the spirit is that consciousness of God. So we're very distinct from, from the animals in that sense. And of course, we're also distinct in the fact that God only made one man, and out of man came woman. Now, he made a whole bunch of horses and whales and dinosaurs and everything else, but he only made two or one and then pulled the two. But he created. Created. Yeah, he created. made woman. Yeah. Is that, is that how it was phrased? Yeah. Came out of the womb of man. Uh, and one, one uh, I read one commentary, they said there was an interesting parallel that his bride came from his side. And of course, Christ was pierced in the side. And from that, from his death on the cross, came his bride. I don't know if that's a interesting enough parallel, but somebody made that point. Because yeah, it says he, he opened him up and then he closed up the womb. And of course, Christ, according to scripture, he still bears those marks on his body. And it was because what he did, we get to be the bride of Christ. There you go. I like that. The Garden of Eden, of course, uh, planted a garden eastward. Here again, you got to ask the question, why did he mention a direction? Why do you think he mentioned eastward? We don't know where the Garden of Eden is. The garden the now, is this <laughs> after the creation and, and stuff? Because earlier you said that all the trees he made were mature, yeah. and now it's planted. Well, there is one one guy I read, and I, I, I don't know, but uh, he, he created all the heavens and the earth, did everything there, and then he did a creation act in front of Adam. Okay. Yeah, when he planted the garden. So how he planted the garden, I don't know. You know, how he did it, uh, I'm not really sure. Okay. That's why some people say that there's a disparaging account between the two. Uh, you would think more of the words placed. A garden and, and yeah. is it just a difference in translation you know, from what the original yeah. to what this is now? Because I've seen that often. Yeah. I heard one commentary that said that because Adam was made at the end, he didn't see all that earlier creation take place, that now he was being shown in front of him God creating a garden or planting a garden so that he could see God was the one who did the creative act. And some say that that's why Eve was deceived because she didn't see God doing the creation, so she didn't directly see God's creative act. I, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of a uh, lot of interpretation here as to how you want to view this uh, thing. But uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? How do you look at it? the position where he was sitting when he was writing. Yeah. Well, that's what one commentary said that the, it's proof that. Wherever Adam was made, it was to the east of him yeah, that the garden was placed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some people think that the Garden of Eden was near the area of what's today a modern-day Iraq. Of course, if that's eastward, uh, then was God was Adam created over where today is now Israel? <laughs> east of Moses when he wrote it. Huh? East of Moses when he wrote it. Maybe, yeah, could have been. We just don't know. I mean, it could be the author's point of view, not necessarily Adam's. Yeah, yeah, but that's just speculation. But again, I, you know, there's things that God puts in there and makes you ask why, what, what do you mean by that, Lord? That's why I like Chuck Missler's stuff because he's he asks the question and then he tries to find a solution. Not to say that he's always got it right, but there's also the possibility that the tumult from the flood was of such catastrophic proportions that the it simply there's no reference point anymore yeah. of any kind whatsoever. Yeah. You know, that maybe the actual dirt that was being referred to, maybe three thousand feet below level in China. Yeah, right it now. could have been yeah, turned upside down. Yeah. So so there may be no reference point we're looking for. Yeah, and that's what some have said. It's a moot point because mm -hmm. after the flood had occurred there's there's no reference point that we can point to to say, well yeah, that's where it was. It could be, you know, Greenwood, Indiana, probably. Uh, no. Well, there are Euphrates. That had to be somewhere around the Euphrates River, didn't it? Well, 
Well, yeah, some people think that that the after the flood they saw the river and it reminded them of the Euphrates and they right. said, Well we'll call that the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. Some say no, that's the actual Euphrates, so yeah, I don't know. I don't see how the original river would survive no. the geographic the geological event of that magnitude. No. But, but I mean these are nice questions to ask, you know, because God put it there. He again prompting us to ask the question, so I just thought it would have been interesting if if Eden is in modern day Iraq as some people would suspect and it was planted eastward from wherever Adam was was it possible that he was in the same place where Israel is today that'd be symbolically that would fit you know the first man was there the second man died there and then Christ will return there to set up his reign there I don't know. interesting which way do Muslims face when they pray. Mecca. If they're if they're to the yeah if they're to the east of Mecca they'll they'll look west if they're to the west they'll look to the east. Uh, I got two more slides and we'll be done. Uh, some trees majority of the trees of course said were pleasant to look at and good for food but there was two of course the tree of life which brings immortality and the tree of knowledge of good and evil which brought death and some interesting little piece I got a Chuck Missler you know the ELS codes that we talked about way way back. Well, I guess there's, in this chapter, there's the encoding of a whole bunch of different kind of trees mentioned that are in the equal letter sequence codes in chapter 2. So there's all these trees that are mentioned. So these might very well be some of the trees that were there. Poplar, chestnut, barley, that's it. Well, that's wheat. Wine, cedar, aloe. Crazy if I tell you those are my yard. So that's it for today. Wow, we went fast. <coughs> See, I told you to speed up. Yeah. <laughs> We've actually cut a lot of the things that we could have covered. We covered way back in the beginning, so it's gonna. I'm putting the, I'm putting the foot down on the gas a little. Shift into second gear. So, any questions? Any comments? Lewd remarks? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would somebody mind going ahead and closing this out in prayer? Any volunteers? No? Would you like to, Jason? Thanks. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. That we just uh, really just digging into your word, Lord. <coughs> just as uh, Jeff mentioned, just the deeper things of you, Lord. It's just amazing when you look at your word. It just all points to you, Lord Jesus, and we're thankful for that. And Lord, we just pray just to, well, first of all, Lord, we thank you for fathers today. And just, uh, just the impact they've had on all of our lives, Lord. And we all ultimately thank you for you, Lord, the greatest father, the, the ultimate father, Lord. Just the ultimate sacrifice you made for us, Lord. And I just pray that as we worry about the Sabbath today, Lord, that we'll just make every day a Sabbath in terms of just drawing closer to you and wanting to have a deeper relationship with you. Again, we thank you for everything you've given us, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for Pastor Ken as he gives this message today, Lord, that we will just, through that message, we will just have a deeper understanding of who you are and how much you love us. In Jesus' mighty precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.